All right, so uh, the risk of relapse after initial therapy in Hodgkin lymphoma, overall, about 10 to 20 percent of patients with localized disease will eventually experience recurrence, whereas up to about 30 percent of patients who initially present with advanced stage disease will recur. And I just wanted to highlight the importance of rebiopsying patients because occasionally you'll find that a patient actually has an inflammatory process or has a gray zone lymphoma or large cell lymphoma. And as Nancy already mentioned, um, there's been a lot of data looking at uh, the prognostic value of PET scan uh, pre-transplant in uh, predicting progression-free survival. And these are a number of studies, uh, most of which, as you can see, have been published by Craig Moskowitz, um, looking at the predictive value here. And for patients who are PET positive going into transplant, about 30 percent of patients will be progression-free at four to five years whereas those who are PET negative, uh, four to five year PFS is in the 80% range. So similar to what Nancy has just presented, uh, there are a number of different salvage chemotherapy regimens, and I think it is quite difficult to compare across regimens given the fact that the earlier studies, and you can see in the references, the ones here that have the complete remission rates in the 19 to 26 percent range were done prior to the use of PET scan. When PET scans came in, the CR rates went up substantially, and you can see CR rates in the order of 50 to 60 percent with these regimens, and as high as 76 percent with a very recently published regimen of uh, bendamustine, gemcitabine, and vinarelbine. The one thing I would point about, out about that particular regimen is that the response assessment was done after four cycles. Typically, we would use two or maybe three cycles of salvage chemotherapy, and I think this can become important, uh, as Nancy um, has already spoken about, in trying to get patients to transplant quickly. So all of you know brintuximab vidotin. This is the antibody drug conjugate that targets CD30 and uh, delivers MMAE, which disrupts microtubules. Recent data suggests that there may be other mechanisms of action of this drug that may um, cause immunogenic cell death by stress to the endoplasmic reticulum. This is the original data that the pivotal trial that led to the approval of brentuximab in uh, 98 patients, and you can see this impressive waterfall plot. I think it's important to point out here about 75 percent of patients will respond to the drug where the complete remission rate uh, is about 30 percent, which is a number that keeps cropping up uh, across the different studies. And here is the overall and progression-free survival, and you can see as a single agent, um, Although being very uh, active, again, the median progression-free survival is less than six months. However, we do know from other publications that there are a small percentage of patients who achieve a complete remission that may be more durable. So this data, as Nancy also pointed out, led to uh, the BV plus ICE study that was done at Memorial. And again, this was a sequential approach with the goal of trying to get patients to autologous transplant without having to undergo uh, intensive chemotherapy. And again, there were uh, 46 patients enrolled. Sorry, this is rather small. But do want to point out that this is a, um, a high-risk patient population with about half of patients having primary refractory disease. And here, patients received uh, two cycles of brentuximab, which was given days 1, 8, and 15, so a more compressed and more intensive uh, regimen than were typically given in the relapse and refractory setting. Those who achieved a complete remission went on to autologous transplant. Those who did not achieve a complete remission then received augmented ICE. And uh, the PET uh, negative definition in this study was uh, DOVA 1 and 2, and with that, 27% um, of the patients were PET negative. And in these uh, event-free survival curves, you can see that there was no difference in event-free survival whether you achieved uh, complete remission with rentuximab alone or required the addition of augmented ICE. On multivariable analysis, they looked at uh, the independent predictors of outcome. Uh, the only one that was statistically significant, again, was having a positive PET scan going into transplant. This was the second study. This was a study done by Rob Chen at City of Hope with a similar sort of uh, design. Patients, 37 patients were enrolled and received two cycles of standard dosing of brentuximab, 1.8 milligrams per kilogram every three weeks for up to four cycles, and then underwent a PET scan. 
Um, those who were PET negative um, proceeded to autologous stem cell transplant, and then it was up to the investigator. Some of those patients who achieved a partial remission, four of four of whom went on to receive transplant. One also had radiation of, to stable disease and proceeded to transplant. The remainder of the patients then went on to get additional uh, chemotherapy with ICE. Some made it to transplant where some had progressive disease. This study was only looking for complete remission rate by PET scan as a proxy for um, overall outcome, uh, and they did not report any of the event-free survival data, so this is what we have. Um, and very similar to the other study, you can see that the complete remission rate with brentuximab given once every three weeks uh, compared very similarly to the more intensified regimen at about 30%. Um, once patients got uh, salvage chemotherapy, and I misspoke, they were able to get a number of different regimens. Um, the complete remission rate was 60%. So these two studies look very, very similar. So what about other chemotherapy options? Uh, you know, both ICE is, and augmented ICE are inpatient regimens and are associated with significant uh, myelosuppression and other toxicity. So this led to this uh, study using brentuximab plus bendamustine, a drug that we know in the refractory and relapse setting has an overall response rate of 50 to 75 percent. So if we put these two drugs together in the outpatient setting, could we achieve very high complete remission rates? So this is the design of the study. Patients got brentuximab on day one with bendamustine 90 milligrams per meter squared on days uh, one and two. After two cycles of therapy, they went to PET scan, and at that point, if, if a patient had a complete remission, they could go on to autologous transplant. It says optional transplant, but really the goal of this study was to assess this as a salvage regimen to go to transplant. So this is the table one, and again, 55 patients. This is a very similar population to the other studies in that about half of the patients have primary refractory disease. The most common toxicity seen in this study was infusion-related reactions, and these could be, as you can see um, below, quite significant. The most common symptoms were fever, chills, flushing, uh, and nausea. Uh, the rash was very, very common, and based on the number of reactions that were seen early in the study, the study was amended to add mandatory premedication with 100 milligrams of methylprednisolone with uh, Benadryl and Tylenol, and you can see after the amendment, there was a significantly lower rate of uh, significant uh, infusion reactions. And here is the response data. The overall response rate was extremely high at 93%, and you can see the complete remission rate here is 76%, so really the highest complete remission rate we've seen uh, in all of the salvage regimens thus far. And aside from the infusion reactions, was really um, quite well tolerated, and there were no issues uh, with stem cell mobilization. This is the progression-free survival data, and as you get out towards the end of the curve, they're very small numbers, but at 18 uh, months, about 80% uh, uh, of patients remain in remission. So we can't do a talk on Hodgkin's uh, in this era without mentioning checkpoint inhibitors, and Hodgkin's really is the prototypical disease for looking at this approach, given that we know that the Reed-Sternberg cell uh, has near uniform amplification of 9P24, which leads to the upregulation of PDL1 and PDL2. And there's uh, immunohistochemical stains uh, showing the uh, PDL1 expression on Reed-Sternberg cells, and these are uh, images uh, of the copy gain and then the amplification on the right with the significantly increased numbers of uh, 9P copies. So in this table, I've just sort of summarized the data that we have thus far on the checkpoint inhibitors, a number of different studies uh, using both uh, nivolumab and pembrolizumab. And uh, the overall response rates are really quite similar across all these studies in the range of uh, sort of 60 to 75 percent. And I'll even point out this one here uh, includes 80 patients, all of whom had had prior brentuximab, vedotin, but had not had disease that was um, responsive enough to go to an auto stem cell transplant. So these are really our uh, refractory patient population, and the response rates, the overall and complete remission rates were very similar. I uh, will point out that the complete remission rates in, in these studies were low, uh, though even patients who have stable or partial remission are often able to stay on therapy for a long period of time without experienced disease progression. 
The toxicity profile, unlike chemotherapy, very different. Um, and I think, as you all know, we see a lot of inflammatory processes. And this is what was seen in the studies with diarrhea um, being the most common at up to 30 percent, a small percentage of patients having pneumonitis uh, or colitis, thyroid disease, uh, and uh, uh, rash uh, being common but low grade and, and manageable. So overall, these two agents have remarkably similar activity in uh, relapsed and refractory Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, and this begs the question, can we add nivolumab to the salvage regimen to get even a better response to what we see with chem chemotherapy? So this is uh, data that was presented at ASH by Alex Herrera this year, um, combining brentuximab and nivolumab. Uh, this is the study schema, and in the first cycle, um, the brentuximab and nivolumab are staggered, though there is an amendment to this study which is going to allow accrual of up to, I believe, an additional 30 patients where the two drugs will be given together on day one. Patients get two cycles um, every three weeks and then have a CT scan to ensure that there is no disease progression. It's probably too early to assess for a response, uh, and then after four cycles, undergo a PET CT scan again, with the goal of getting patients to autologous stem cell transplant. So 42 patients uh, were available for this uh, presentation at ASH, and very similar to all of our prior uh, patients uh, in these uh, setting, about 40 percent, maybe a little bit lower with primary refractory disease, the majority of whom had had prior ABVD. There were infusion-related reactions, uh, again, um, but uh, less severe than what was seen with the uh, brentuximab and bendamustine. Uh, most of the reactions here are grade one and two, where in the other study there were a lot of grade three reactions. Um, this study required uh, mandatory low-dose steroids uh, at 100 of hydrocortisone, worried about interfering with the uh, activity of the checkpoint inhibitor. So this is the uh, adverse events, and as you can see overall, um, about 35 percent of patients had infusion-related reactions, and then diarrhea and rash, again, were the most commonly seen adverse events, but the majority of these were low-grade. And this is the tumor response. Uh, and here, uh, a negative PET scan was defined as DOVA 1, 2, and 3. And you can see the overall response rate was very high at 90 percent. The complete remission rate is a little bit lower uh, at 62 percent compared to the brentuximab and demustine, where it's about 75 percent. Um, so overall, how do we put all this data together? You know, Clearly, there are multiple second-line therapy options, and as Nancy pointed out, we don't have randomized studies to help us know what is really the best strategy to get your patient to autologous stem cell transplant. I think we can agree that um, be, having a negative PET going into transplant appears to be a very good predictor of progression-free survival. I think brentuximab alone, um, if you're trying to get a patient to transplant uh, with a complete remission rate of 30 percent, I don't think that is personally not what I would do. I know there are others who feel that you can spare a patient the toxicity of augmented ice or of chemotherapy, um, but I think that delays patients getting to transplant where they're obviously going to get very high dose chemotherapy that's going to be toxic. So in my mind, you want to get people there as quickly as possible. So I would argue for giving brentuximab plus chemotherapy because I think that's really associated with the highest complete remission rates with reasonable toxicity. Uh, brentuximab plus nivolumab, you know, I, I think the jury's still out on this, on this trial. Uh, the complete remission rates are lower. I think we don't really know what we're going to see in terms of toxicity in patients who've had prior bleomycin uh, and then get nivolumab and then get a BCNU-containing autologous stem cell transplant regimen. We've seen some toxicity. I think there is a cumulative toxicity, and I think we need to pay attention to that. So again, um, to get patients quickly to transplant, I would favor giving brentuximab plus bendamustine, um, though clearly this, this is from an abstract. We, the, the paper um, should be published soon, but I can, you know, that caveat. And I will say, be careful of the infusion reactions. They are significant, and you really need to premedicate patients because, again, you want to get people through two cycles of salvage to get them to auto, and if you have too much toxicity and they come off, you may delay your auto. And I think the other option would be to give brentuximab plus ice. Um, 
up front without giving the run-in of brentuximab alone. I think brentuximab alone is a very good regimen for older patients or those who are not eligible for stem cell transplant as a single agent because then you can always, you have other options including checkpoint inhibitors.